welcome to episode three of the Lions Led by Donkeys podcast. We're your hosts, Joe and Nick. And uh, today's kind of like a D-Day special, even though we know our podcast comes out on Monday, so it's going to be past D-Day, so I guess the special part really doesn't matter. It's our D-Day extravaganza several yes. days after D-Day. Um, how are you doing, Nick? Uh, could be better, but can't complain. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever. So today we're covering... Bill Millen, also known as Piper Bill or the Mad Piper. Given to that name was given to him by the Germans. Yeah. Yeah. It's so cool shit. Um and if you if the uh, song in the beginning sounded somewhat familiar, it was from um The Longest Day. Um and it's the dulcet towns tones of a s- hot sack of Scottish air. <laughs> and it sounds terrible. <laughs> As of all bagpipes. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, William Bill Millen was born on 14 July 1922 in Regina, Saskatchewan, Canada, to Scottish parents. When Bill was three, they moved back to the Scottish motherland when his father decided to become a policeman in Glasgow. Uh, he joined the Territorial Army, which is kind of like their version of reserves. Yeah. In Fort William, Scotland, and played the pipes in the Highland Light Infantry Band and the Queen's Own Cameron Highlanders Band before deciding he wanted to become a commando. He was assigned to number four commando and served as the personal piper to Simon Fraser, the 15th Lord Lovett, 25th <laughs> Chief of the Clan Fraser, commander of the, of the 1st Special Services Brigade. And this is normally when I make the joke about it being the most British name in history, but he's not technically British, so it's the most Scottish name in fucking history. Um, he also, Lovett had a sweet turtleneck in the longest yard. Oh, the longest day. <laughs> the longest yard. He wasn't in the longest yard, the longest day. <laughs> if he was in the longest yard, he'd probably be wearing the same sweet turtleneck. Same turtleneck and Piper falling around a prison. <laughs> um, like anybody else today, uh, Bill probably thought the whole title of being the personal Piper of somebody was kind of like a peacetime uh, ceremonial gig. And once the bullets started flying, he would probably fight as a commando, just so like he's been trained, just like everybody else. Um, you know, commando shit. Yeah, yeah. And they don't waste money training people to be commandos and then like have them shriek noises out of a sack of air <laughs> in combat. Um, and uh, you know, bagpipes have been played by Scottish and Irish soldiers for generations, so all this per- personal piper business was completely normal, uh, especially for someone as important as Lovett who's a prominent member of the uh, Iverness Highlands aristocracy. And uh, you don't get all those sweet titles without having a piper come with it. Um, it was tradition. However, high, higher English command, obviously seeing the issue with having a, muni- a musician on the modern battlefield, restricted their uses to the rear, far away from combat. Uh, they would be consigned to history and brought, be brought out for ceremonial purposes, just like everyone probably assumed they would be. Right. You know, what, where military instruments pretty much belong in the 20th century. There's no need to be making music on the battlefield. You're just right. going to fucking die. Um, it turned out, unfortunately for poor Bill, that Lord Lovett took his bagpiping incredibly seriously. <laughs> uh, he ordered Millen, they then aged 21, uh, to play them at the landing at Sword Beach anyway. Uh, Millen, obviously unsettled by the prospect of blowing hot air into a sack while facing a storm of German machine gun fire, point out this is actually against military regulation. Um, Lovett probably had one of the funniest answers to this ever. Um, he didn't let something like military regulation slow him down. He was a fucking lord. He's, he said, ah, but that's the English war office. You and I are both Scottish, so it doesn't apply. Right. <laughs> and it should probably point out that it absolutely applied to them. They no, fell under English command. <laughs> but he had a sweet turtleneck, so yeah. fuck it. And a mustache. His mustache yeah. is quite nice, too. I mean, it, it's not on the level of the other mustaches we've talked about thus far, but no. it, it's up there. It's respectful. Yeah. Um, Millen probably assures any of us right now knew that Levitt wasn't making any sense, he, but he simply obeyed his commander. Um, he, I guess he knew better. I don't know. Lovett didn't exactly have a, a bad reputation. He's pretty highly respected, right. uh, which explains why he just like nodded and said, all right, let's, uh, let's go ahead and play these bagpipes. Well, in all honesty, I assume Millen thought he was fucking joking because he played his pipes while waking, wading through the water. Right. And as soon as he got to the beaches, he stopped playing and Lovett says, oh, play a tune, Millen. And Millen sarcastically goes, eh. What tune would you like to hear? 
He says, oh, the road to the Isles. So, me still thinking, oh, this guy's fucking around. He says, do you want me to march up and down the beach? He's like, oh, yes, 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 lovely. March up and down. <laughs> and yeah, he yeah. proceeded. And I can imagine... Millen was being a smart ass like any other like junior enlisted soldier in the history oh, of the military sure. whenever there you know there's a higher command person that gets like the good idea fairy and like oh so you want me to do this stupid shit now and he was probably assuming that love would be like no that that's dumb that doesn't make any sense so he kind of like fucked himself yeah and I'm marching up and down the goddamn beach <laughs> playing some fucking dropping some sick beats <laughs> his diss track on <laughs> um so, on June 6th, 1944, at around 0725, Millen and about 28,000 other soldiers of the British Empire set sail for Sword Beach. And we're going to take a little pause there, uh, talk a little bit more about Sword Beach, as because we're Americans, we really don't hear about it a lot. Um, if, our fine, if the fine history teachers of the Waterford School District in Michigan are to be believed, American soldiers stormed up Omaha and Utah beaches and kicked the Nazis out of France all by themselves. Essentially. Yeah. Um, you don't really hear a whole lot about the the British efforts on D-Day. Well, Sword was one of five different landings that occurred that day. American forces of the First Army under command of General Omar Bradley would land at Utah and Omaha beaches, while the British Second Army under the command of General Miles Dempsey would land at Gold, Juno, and Sword beaches. Um, I say British Second Army, that also included uh, Kiwis, Canadians, uh, Aussies, it, but they all fell under British command. There are a few Polish... The Free Polish Army. Yeah. Yeah. So, as the boats landed in the killing fields of Sword Beach and German machine gun fire tore his comrades to shreds, Millen, standing up in totally open enemy fire, played a heartwarming version of Highland Laddie, The Road to the Isles, and All the Blue Bonnets Are Over the Border. Um, just like Nick was just saying, he's just straight up not taking cover, marching <laughs> back and forth uh, and railing people forward. And that's something that um, Lovett said in one of his uh, interviews. He was like, yeah, it raises the spirit. Like, well, I, like, can you just imagine, like, him just wincing every time a bullet <laughs> comes by as he's trying to, like, blow air into this tube? It's like, oh, fuck, nope, this is it. Here's the big <laughs> he can't one. fuck up the diss track. Yeah. yeah. Well, he's not fucking hitting fades. He's fucking blowing up diss tracks. It's fucking awesome. <laughs> Um, resistance in the beachhead was intense. Destroyed vehicles and the dead and the wounded began piling up on the shore. Um... This whole insane scene was immortalized in the movie we talked about before, The Long Stay, where you see commandos come ashore, leaping off their Higgins boats and into the churning horror of the beach water. Um, they slowly push against the tide of incoming fire, trying to advance towards their objectives. In the middle of all of them was Bill dropping sick fucking beats. <laughs> Play that fucking track. <laughs> Other than his pipes, Millen was only armed with a traditional kilt knife. Oh, yeah, we kind of forgot to mention the kilt thing. Um... <laughs> Millen was wearing his clan tartan kilt, the same exact kilt his dad had worn fighting in the fields of Flanders in World War I. Millen makes it a point to tell people in interviews given of the day uh, that he wasn't wearing any underwear per tradition um, and it was freeballing. And uh, when the water hit his balls, it took his, the air out of his lungs. And uh, so I can have a, a story that has absolutely nothing to do with D-Day to, uh, to pair with that. was uh, When I was in Afghanistan, I took a knee and um, I was also going commando, and my pants ripped a stay wide hole in them, um, just dropping my nuts in full view <laughs> of everybody. And I felt a little exposed, and I wasn't being chewed apart by German machine gun bullets. I can't imagine how, like, I mean, I, I know he wasn't exactly wearing a mini skirt, and like no. his, his mushroom stamp was it like sticking out the end, <laughs> but he's still pretty fucking exposed. These are still above knee length, but you know, and. Um, Huge balls for a kill. Yeah, it's it's surprising. No could fucking withhold. It is really surprising that he was able to wade to the shore, uh, being weighed down by the fucking anchors that were his nuts, because <laughs> how big they were. And uh, so our host Nick here uh, also raided a beach when he was cosplaying in a My Chemical Romance music cosplay. video. It's fucking uh, reenacting. Tell us a little bit about that, because when he first told me that story. I did not, I thought it was fucking insane that for some reason they got, how many reenactors? It was around 50. Yeah, like 50 dudes kitted out in World War II era uniforms down to the very boats to storm 
some beach in California. San Diego. Yeah, it's in <laughs> San Diego for a My Chemical Romance music video. <laughs> yeah, and uh, you know what? You don't see the chaos that ensued that day, but uh, a lot of rifles got rusted that we <laughs> didn't need to get rusted over 60 years old. Did you see someone almost fucking drowned? Yes, the first uh, <laughs> fucking uh, midget that went in, this little fucking dude, he's like, all right, let's go, dong. <laughs> just sank We're to like, the bottom. Oh, fuck. <laughs> well, he was only 5'3". That's pretty short. That is really short. I mean, that's not midget-esque, but it's definitely little guy. Um, so, well, uh, compared to us. Yeah, I mean, we're both over six feet tall, but, so. uh, but at this point, um, so we were talking about his kilt because it's a tactical skirt. Um, Basically. Yeah. Um, creating fighting positions with his balls. <laughs> um, so in the longest day, it shows the entire commando unit wearing kilts and that actually wasn't true. Um. While it was common during World War I for Scottish Highlanders soldiers to wear kilts, uh, they, that actually earned them the nickname the Ladies from Hell from the Germans. Um, the Scottish <laughs> units of the British Army, yeah. I thought it was like the Bitches from Hell or something like that. But, That'd be way better. Yeah, but the Germans apparently called them the Ladies from Hell. Classy. Yeah, I mean, you go to... I mean, he's storming a beach here, but imagine like muddy, disgusting trench warfare and you're... <laughs> Wearing no underwear. Exactly. Like that, I, I feel like we need to mention that part more, that they're just freeballing their right. way through the most horrific parts Genital of human hygiene. history. Non-existent in the trenches. <laughs> so everybody smells like balls and scotch whiskey. Yeah, I'm sure they didn't really have baby wipes. I'm sure they didn't. To do some like, <laughs> fucking hot areas. <laughs> um, but, you know, Scottish units of the British Army wore regular uniforms during World War II. Um, Bill Millen was the only person running ashore in his Scottish tactical dress. Um... Uh, Thankfully for the British on the beach, almost all of the army's armored vehicles made it to shore, unlike pretty much every other beach. <laughs> like Omaha. Yeah. And the engineers made quick work of the obstacles and mines, and um, the infantry managed to advance. During the fight, nearly, nearly a thousand British were lost at the beach, um, which isn't the worst of the of D-Day, and it's certainly not the worst of the war, but still a lot for you know a couple hours. Right. Um, and I'd like to add... The uniforms they wore back then were straight 100% wool. Getting that shit wet sucks. <laughs> so they became waterlogged. Yes, and fucking itchy as shit. <laughs> uh, one of the captured German snipers um, said that he didn't want to shoot Millen. He would have felt bad because they thought he went insane. <laughs> um, it's kind of hard to argue with that because I, I mean, I don't know if I wouldn't have shot the guy, but... I certainly would have thought he went insane. He's probably playing some really good shit. Yeah. So he's, he's like, oh. I'll wait until the next track before <laughs> I shoot him. I really dig this one. <laughs> Finish the song. <laughs> next play, do host. <laughs> um, so we have to pause again to um, explain Operation Deadstick, which was the British Airborne Operations of D-Day, um, which is, was also in The Longest Day when... Bagpipers, everybody came to the rescue. Um, but later, Mill and Lovett and the rest of the commandos would show up in the relief of the stranded paratroopers who had set off in the night of June 5th, the day before, with the goal of landing a few hours before the amphibious landing. They were to secure landing zones for the coming 7th Parachute Battalion. Once they're on the ground, they were going to um, try to control bridgeheads for the advance to go over. And uh, for those of you that don't know, that operation is a perfect name for what they did they uh got there by glider which you're essentially just crashing this is a crash landing i believe buzz lightyear would call it falling with style that's true <laughs> <laughs> um yeah the paratroopers were thrown to earth by badly made plywood gliders towed by halifax bombers yeah canvas and wood and on landing most of them shattered broken half and nearly killed everybody inside right um, the first casualty of the operation was actually a soldier who fell into a large pond and drowned. Um, probably weighed down by everything he had to carry. Yeah, it's uh, during D-Day, the huge farm areas, they flooded, the Germans flooded, just in case of an, that exact thing, an airborne operation. You're not going to get all your stuff off in time. And how, how much about does all that weigh? I know uh, you, you, you played around with all that stuff. So when I reenacted, I did 82nd Airborne, 
So their kit varied a little, but it did. Still, I mean, same end state. Right. And they wore way too much for the flotation device to even handle. So they essentially wore it for no reason. So they, once they strapped on there, was it the gasset bag you called it? The muset bag. Muset bag. Once they strapped on the muset bag and all the ammo and their weapons and grenades and everything else, they strapped on a life jacket over it. They might as well have just been wearing a sweater like it didn't do anything. You throw your parachute harnesses over your Mae West, and the Mae West was your uh, life preserver. Nicknamed because Mae West had big tits. Basically. Classy. It was awesome. <laughs> so, it didn't work at all, and the first harnesses we had and we used were not quick-release harnesses, so a lot of guys drowned for that because of that reason. So they'd hit the water and not be able to get the parachute off? Exactly. And that's also... They came up with the idea of, oh, well, we'll give them this knife. I think it was the B3 knife to carry in our, the little pocket um, close to your collar. Not like the K-bar that they already carried for the bayonet. No. we uh, The bayonet they carried, which varied. I know it wasn't exactly a K-bar. but No. It, uh, it, it varied. Some guys didn't want to wear it because you wore it on your, uh, your hip. And as you know, PLF, you're going to land on your hip. Explain a little bit what PLF is, in case there's someone listening who is in the military. So PLF is basically your five points of contact. You like tuck and roll effectively. Basically a tuck and roll, but you never do it how you were trained to do it. It's just you hit the ground feet ass head. For basically <laughs> hard as shit. <laughs> well, um, so the the British Airborne operation, when they landed, was a, a complete clusterfuck. I mean, I guess in this episode, it isn't really about... A donkey leading any lions, but if we were to call something here a donkey, it would be Operation Dead Stick in the first couple hours. Um, they almost got overran, um, got separated from their support weapons. It pretty much, you know, they showed it uh, the American version Band of Brothers when everybody got separated and you know picking up German weapons, right? Because their weapons ended up somewhere else. Um, pretty much the same thing. And a smaller scale happened to the Brits with the benefit they knew um, that they weren't exactly uh, invading the most defended beachhead. So they knew, um, you know, their their main force wasn't too far behind them. Um, in this case, uh, they were hours late um, on the Battle of Pegasus Bridge, where the 7th Parachute Battalion was dug in with elements of the 6th. Um, they kept expecting the commandos with armor uh, support to show up anytime, um, and it just didn't happen. And you know, like, all right, they'll, you know, they're gonna be here anytime. And hmm. then finally, at thirteen thirty, the same day, so they've been fighting for thirteen hours almost on these bridges. Um, the paratroopers heard the faint but growing sound of bagpipes <laughs> coming from the direction of the beach. <laughs> A sweet mixtape. Uh, yeah. Uh, it was our boy Bill and and Lovett's commandos at his back. Um, they marched across the bridge in relief, taking heavy casualties. And when I say marched, they were literally marching. Um, not necessarily like in step to the bagpipe or anything, but they were just like casually strolling in ranks um, in relief. And they got lit up by snipers and machine guns mm -hmm. and lost 12 people of, I mean, this isn't exactly a whole division. This is a commando unit, so it's smaller than normal. 12, losing more, 12 more people is damaging. Oh, yeah. Um, but thankfully, they linked up with members of the Oxen Bucks Light Infantry and helped, and held the bridge until um, the armor could get there, and they chased the Germans off. Um, thankfully, for poor Bill... Um, Lord Lovett finally let him put his damn bagpipes down <laughs> uh, after that. And uh, further action in the war, he was allowed to operate like, a, like an actual soldier. Though we aren't sure if he was allowed to put pants on. They never actually talked about that. <laughs> I wouldn't want to. I mean, you never have to worry about swamp ass. Exactly. Um, you know, Bill saw action in the Netherlands and Germany. And uh, his time as a regular commando was finally allowed to happen. Um and he no longer had to fight like a crazy person armed with a shrieking sack of air. <laughs> um, and it, you know, it should be noted that somehow through all this, Bill was never wounded. Um, Which is insane. Yeah. He, he was never hurt, even through the rest of his campaigns, which uh, I don't think he fought at Market Garden in Arnhem. 
but I don't know what other th theater that uh, Commando would have been fighting in, in the Netherlands. I'm not sure as well. Um, but the the record on Bill's later war services is pretty pretty thin because it stopped being cool to talk about him when he wasn't playing music. Hmm. Um, so after the war, he demobilized in 1946 and continued to serve Lord Lovett at his estate. Um, he made regular trips back to the beaches to play pipes uh, for commemorations of right. the dead and everything. And sometimes he played alongside of his own dad, uh, which is pretty cool. Um, he was awarded the French Legion of Honor in 2009 and died in Torbay in 2010. Um, yeah, so that is Bill Millen. Um, uh, just the straight psychopath that I think knew what he was doing was crazy, which is like probably one of the funniest things about the whole thing is like there's in all of his interviews, he, he never makes it sound like the, the stoic old war veteran who's, I just did what I had to do. Yeah. It's like, yeah, he fucking told me to run across the goddamn <laughs> beach shrieking just air out of a sack. Crazy as it sounds. Yeah. And, and, and he knew it was nuts and he knew like his Lord had lost his damn mind. Um, you can kind of tell, like, I, you know, in, um, in his interviews, he, he makes it sound like he was just a regular smart ass <laughs> and, uh, things just kept working out in his favor and he never got hurt. And I, I have no idea how. It's insane. Yeah. But it's a cool fucking story. It's probably one of my favorite, well, it is my favorite story from D-Day. That's why we're doing it for the, uh, the D-Day special. Um, I mean, you hear stuff about people running into machine gun nests and throwing grenades back at the Germans. Right. But like he literally did nothing offensive during D-Day. He never fired a weapon. He never, he, as far as we know, and as far as Bill's ever admitted, he never shanked any Germans with his fucking sweet kill <laughs> with knife. His fucking pipes. Yeah. He never like smacked anybody with his pipes. He mm. never, you know, um, and that like his, the exact uniform that he wore that day is in a museum and uh, like the Imperial War Museum with his bagpipes. Yep. <laughs> um, he was just serenading the enemy. I, I feel like you you were right when you said he was fucking dropping diss tracks. Like he's oh, for sure. spitting hot fire out of his oh, pipes. Yeah. Um, when he's not handing out fades. No. Nah. Fucking throwing down diss tracks. He's dropping some sick beats on the Germans. And, you know, they never recovered because, unfortunately for them, their, their rap battle skills... <laughs> went, went downhill pretty fast over D-Day. Yes. Um, so that's our podcast for today. Um, as before, you know, we update every Monday, and hopefully next week we'll have a more traditional donkey for you. Um, but we're going to keep doing more stuff like this where we talk about just weird, insane stuff that happens from, throughout the history of war. Uh, we're going to try to talk about more stuff that you probably haven't heard Um anywhere else like everybody's heard of of a few giant scripts like custer and stuff mm -hmm. like that we're so we're gonna do our best to, try to branch out um talk about more things um maybe stuff like this maybe um i don't know stuff from antiquity that oh, we yeah. like to talk about um and it'd be cool you guys could even suggest shit yeah well that'd be cool if you know something from history or you are like us, I guess, amateur historians. I know Dan Carlin gets away with saying he's not a historian, so I feel perfectly comfortable saying oh, I'm yeah. not. Um, if you have something, please let us know. You know, you find us on Twitter at uh, jcast99 and Nick at uh, nickcastm1. That's right. Um, I finally remembered it. And this is actually the first podcast that we had. We both have headphones. Yeah, this is great. I know. We're moving on up, man. We even got a fucking board for the ideas we that we have. Board. Yeah, we uh we are getting an official in uh my guest bedroom. Shit's getting <laughs> weird and awesome. Um so yeah, you can follow the the podcast itself on Twitter at uh Lions underscore lead. Um also huge thanks to uh Ben Watson from the Defense One podcast I did the other day, because this kinda gave me an idea for this to branch off on and also the other person i talked about who we have dubbed umbrella jesus who we will talk about <laughs> further um a uh, huge thanks to following us and subscribing to us um i can't believe we have over 200 listens and almost 200 subscribers it's kind of oh, mind yeah. in, in one week yeah um so uh do us a favor share and 
leave us a rating in iTunes. I keep hearing that's a big deal. Yeah, let us know if we suck or if we're terrible. Either one. Yeah, Nick wants to know how bad he sucks. Yeah, um, I, I do. Yeah, I know I'm terrible already, so. I know I'm terrible, I just like to hear it. Yeah. He's into the humiliation aspect. Yes. <laughs> so, well, I guess uh, that is all for today, and we will see you next Monday.